Good afternoon and welcome to a Rams Review podcast special. I'm joined by a very special guest, Seb, from the Blue Monday podcast. And we've got Seb onto the show to talk about the latest signing, a gentleman by the name of Caden Jackson, who's just signed a two-year deal uh, with Derby County. And uh, Seb, let's get you involved straight away. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Great to, great to be here. Thanks for having us on. No problem at all. And I appreciate your time being with us to talk about Caden Jackson. But first of all, let's talk about Ipswich Town um, and the incredible roller coaster you've had over the, the last eight years, you know, following it with the Blue Monday podcast. How has the last eight years been? And uh, you find yourself in the promised land now. And uh, how are things looking for Ipswich Town? You used the right word there. Incredible. The podcast is now into its into its 10th season. It's been eight years of real hard work at times. It was started by a couple of guys when we were kind of flirting with sixth in the championship under Mick McCarthy. And we all know we get relegated to League One. There's a huge clear out of staff, years of underperformance. And it was it was quite tough to come on here and talk about multiple nil-nil draws against the likes of Northampton, etc. But the last two years since Kieran McKenna came in has been absolutely superb. I think we were always expecting to get out of League One pretty quickly, um, but I think even the most diehard Ipswich fan probably wouldn't have admitted to expecting a second place finish last season with 96 points. Most of us thought we might flirt with the playoffs, uh, have kind of a, a, a year of consolidation, then look to go again. But what we did was absolutely incredible. There were so many highlights along the way, so many amazing moments that will live with us forever. And yeah, we are now a Premier League club again, and we're we're, we're going into into the season sort of you know a bit apprehensive of what's to come. But with McKenna in the dugout, I'll be honest, I'll believe anything after the last two years. What do you think was the change between McKenna and Paul Cook? What what was the big sort of circumstance or, or what happened that that sort of changed Ipswich Town into the team they are now? Because I remember the Paul Cook team and I think some Ipswich fans called him the bomb squad, whereas he basically went in there, ripped it apart and made it even worse than it was. What 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 changed? What where where did the cogs all start to fall in place? Well, McKenna, I think it's 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 fair to say is a, a, a once in a generational kind of talent. You know, we had Paul Cook. Obviously, we replaced Paul Lambert. We were it was our third year down at League One level. Paul Cook came in. I think we were actually in the playoffs when he joined us. We were sixth or so. We kind of expected him to get us across the line into the playoffs, and we'll see what happens. And at the time he was appointed, there were these rumours of a of, of a buyout. Our previous owner Marcus Evans was looking to move on, uh, and there was a, a rumours of a buyout for an American group called Game Changer, and that came to fruition, and and that kind of changed Paul Cook's job. Role. I think he was employed more as an old school manager originally under Marcus Evans, where he would be overseeing all aspects of the club, the recruitment, you know, all the all the normal stuff that you associate maybe with a uh, an older kind of school manager. But this takeover enabled us to go out and spend real money and bring players in, and he kind of he never really got us going in the first four four months of the the back end of the 2020 2021 season. And he kind of self-labelled himself the demolition man and he introduces the bomb squad and we had 19 players come in, 20 players go out. We'll discuss Caden Jackson and where he kind of fell in that in that kind of scattering of the of the dominoes. But again, the next season, even with this backing, he never ever got us going. And and you know, all the all the talk was he was a lovely, lovely guy, but you know, was he maybe a little bit tactically naive at times? I think that was a fair thing to say. And under the old regime, we would have kept with him for for months on end under Marcus Evans, but the new game change a lot were relatively ruthless. They disposed of him in the December of uh, December 2021. Kieran McKenna comes in, and with the first kind of six months of that season, you start to see what we now see week in week out with patterns of play. He appoints a kind of a there's an entirety of an off 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 field team now with analysts and sports science that simply wasn't there under the likes of Cook and the likes of uh, Lambert and previous managers. And McKenna, as I said, is a generational talent. He's he's, he's the, the the patterns of plays implemented the the ability to coach players again we'll discuss Caden Jackson in a second his ability to get the best out of players and focus on their positives is is an incredible knack and he's turned what was effectively a league one a very good league one side into now Premier League side eight of our starting 11 on the last day just for the season just gone started the last game of the season before and that's a testament to McKenna's coaching and how he's able to to get the best out of every single player at his disposal. So for a dreaming Derby fan wanting to go up to the <laughs> promised land uh, at the end of this season, what what has been what has been the formation or what has been the style of play that's got you through the championship? Because you did have a wobble, sort of March April time. You you I remember driving to the Doncaster, listening to an Ipswich match, and it was something like it potentially could have been a third or fourth defeat on the trot, and things were looking a little bit 
gloomy, but you sort of rode the storm and, and got back on track and then Leeds did you a favour by doing what Leeds always do to capitulate. What was the key to the success? Was it purely the coaching or was it was it an ethos of having a quality throughout the side without going into expensive talents and relying heavily on individuals? Yeah, I mean, McKenna's key attribute is that he's able to make, you know, a team that is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, you look at the players he's brought in, the likes of Sam Morsey, I'll pick as an example, who was signed under Paul Cook as a midfield destroyer. You know, he'd been kind of a disruptor at multiple clubs at championship level, been a good solid pro. But under McKenna, he's now dropping deep. The centre after splitting, he's picking the ball up off the goalkeeper. He's turning. We play we play high risk, high reward football. Uh, you've probably heard of Leif Davis, our left back, 15, 16 assists. His job is simply to stay high and wide. Wes Burns does the same on the other side and yeah McKenna like I said has this knack of getting this get, getting the best out of every single player he's got we don't spend big money by championship standards you know we do by by league one standards but by championship standards we we had no right in reality to compete with Leicester Leeds Southampton and the parachute payments but he found a way to get us there we scored so many late goals which is always a side of you know a, a confident squad an incredibly fit squad and a squad that never knows when it's beaten um, and yeah the, the job he's done has been been phenomenal we we play kind of a 4-2-3-1 the left back stays high the right winger stays high the number 10s get involved it's passing out from the back the center half look to bring the ball into midfield or Morsey will drop and bring the ball into midfield we'll try and get to the byline cut backs to players rushing into the box or dropping back on the penalty spot and for two years it's been it's been simply phenomenal well that brings us nice into Caden Jackson and where he fits into the puzzle because looking at um its history of Ipswich Town we signed for you on the 9th of August in 2018 for a reported million pound purchase from Accrington Stanley. And I always remember reading the headline saying it was Accrington's first million pound sale. Um, 172 appearances, 24 goals. Where did he fit into this 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 turnaround with, with McKenna? Because I remember that he was pretty much frozen out by Cook and he was one of the ones that was pretty much going to go. And then obviously McKenna has seen something Sort of shed light to Derby fans how where this change came from and um, and what the start of his career was like. So Caden Jackson has honestly had one of the strangest careers of any Ipswich Town player in probably the last two decades or so. He was signed to replace Martin Waghorn, who obviously you guys bought from us in the summer of 2018. Uh, I think you spent about five million quid buying him or so. And we obviously then went out and re reinvested some of that into Caden Jackson. Now, it wasn't his fault. I think he'd scored maybe a dozen, 15 goals or so for Accrington at League Two level as they won that title. And it was simply too big a step up to make it into the championship. We got relegated with one of the worst championship points totals of all time he kind of he kind of got three goals that season but it wasn't his fault he was playing as a, a as, as a sole striker at Accrington be playing in more of a two and he kind of never really got going in that first season his most productive season in terms of goals and assists was actually the first year down in league one Paul Lambert in pre-season kind of struggled stumbled across a two up front formation be it a 4-4-2 or a 3-5-2 and he got about 11 goals that year. This is the, the, the COVID curtailed season. He got 11 goals, seven assists and was doing really well. But he, crucially, he was playing as part of a, of a front two. Paul Cook then comes in. He had a big fallout with Lambert about three weeks before Cook was appointed. He got a silly red card at Sunderland and Lambert kind of threw him under the bus in the post-match interview saying he'd cost the team the game. Cook welcomed him back in at first and he kind of played here and there in the, the four months or so before the end of the season. And then, like I mentioned previously, the bomb squad, the demolition man, all that kind of stuff comes out. He's banished to the under 23s, to the reserves. He's playing pre-season friendlies against Berry, our local, Berry St. Edmunds, one of our local local rivals and he's simply not getting a look in that that summer we signed 19 players everybody assumed he would have moved on somewhere but he didn't he stayed he kept his head down he worked incredibly hard these are words i'll probably reiterate you know working hard loyal um doing what's asked of him and he got rewarded with a few kind of starts off the bench here and there but he, he played in the in, in the trophy games and then mckenna comes in and McKenna's first game, he's named on the bench. And that four months, or sorry, six months when McKenna took over, he was trusted in some really big games by McKenna. He was playing as the sole striker. Um, and we went to, you know, we were, I remember going to uh, having Plymouth come to Portman Road in a, a big game that we had to win. And McKenna put his trust in him. And it became very clear that under McKenna's style, you want a front man who can press relentlessly. And the thing you'll notice about Caden Jackson is, A, he is incredibly fast off the blocks. His pace is, 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 is unrivaled. He's a very, very quick player. And he will run all day for the team. See, he's a selfless player. He will he will put himself about and he will press from the front, which is exactly what McKenna wants in that kind of style. 
So those first six months, we kind of saw him kind of get 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 minutes here and there. Then in the League One promotion season, again, he was really trusted, but McKenna kind of repurposed him out wide. He moved wide right, wide left in a 4-2-3-1 behind the striker. And I remember going to Plymouth away, who I think were top of the league at the time, Sheffield Wednesday away, who were closing us down. And in these kind of big games, McKenna would trust Jackson because he knew exactly what he was going to get from him. He was going to press, he was going to protect the fullback, he was going to work incredibly hard, and he still offered a, a, a bit of a goal threat from out wide. So McKenna kind of repurposed him as this wide player. I remember Jackson doing an interview saying, for the first time in years, I've got a manager here who's focusing on what I'm good at i.e. running, closing down, pressing, and not focusing on what I can't do, which is, you know, score 20 goals a season. And that's kind of how his career under McKenna remained till he, till he moved on a few weeks ago. He was kind of fitted in here and there if he needed to for those those kind of crucial games, um, more so as a, as a, as a, as a winger, and a, not a winger, an inside forward right, inside forward left. Uh, only played up front if we had a, an injury crisis, which we did kind of around the new year this season. Um, but you will learn very quickly, he's, he's a very much a Marmite character. I, I think the world of him, but a lot of Ipswich fans were getting really frustrated by the fact that he was kind of still there. But I see that as a testament to his hard work, his professionalism, his determination. And I think the rewards by, well, you know, the, the two promotions are his reward for, for, for the application he put in. Do you think that the the, the fan split at Ipswich over Kane Jackson is because his weaknesses are probably more prominent than his strengths? Or do you think it was just the end product after this lightning pace to beat a back line but ultimately not putting the ball in the net yeah i mean the end product could be frustrating at times but i think people also just associated him with one of the darkest times of our of our club's history which was the the pitiful relegation in 2019 but but again you know it's very hard to blame him because Martin Wycorn got something like 15 goals, 12 assists the year before. The new guy signed him. And Caden Jackson was bought from League Two. So he's stepping up two levels to replace those kind of numbers, which was never going to happen. It, it, it's unrealistic. Had he been bought in as a squad option and been drip-fed in throughout the season, it's very, very different. Um, but the, the step up five years ago, six years ago, for me, was was, was too much of, of an ask. Um, I think... <laughs> How's the easiest way to say it? That I think if you if you understand football, you will appreciate the role Caden Jackson does for a team. He's never going to get you 20 goals a season unless he's playing in a front two, in which case he might chip in here and there. But the, the, the off-ball stuff that you have to be so good at in today's game in terms of the closing down, the pressing, the work rate, the stuff that you don't necessarily see every single week, um, but it's crucial to the way the team plays, that's what he's exceptional at. Do you think that... Do you think he's raw still in, in the sense of Throughout his time at Ipswich, McKenna realised that he couldn't improve. Did he improve him as a footballer or did he just really see the best of the, out of him and got the best out of him by giving him more a simplistic role rather than expect him to sort of break channels, break lines, link up play? Was he pretty much an out and out greyhound who was told to use his pace to, to, to all, almost disrupt defences by picking them off? with his presence rather than his actual ability. Yeah, I mean, you guys will see his pace is his overriding attribute. You know, he can be so, so quick. So we would use him as a kind of pressing from the front kind of player or uh, 60 minutes after the likes of George Hurst or Freddie Ladapo in the in the league one season has kind of tied out defenders. He would be the one to come off the bench and really look to utilize that pace to to kind of you know to to to, to kind of see out games and and cause players and cause defenders uh, difficulties. I think McKenna has improved him. I think he really has improved as a footballer. Some of his decision making uh, in the last couple of years has been has been far superior. He's very good at running the channels. All he all he struggles with is he's not he's simply not a back to goal striker. You know, if you play him as a central striker and he's got to do a job against a, a, a couple of big center offs that simply isn't his game he wants to be on the turn spinning people using that pace to get past and then as we've used him for the last couple of years get to the byline and pull those crosses back for players rushing into the edge of the box so he's been given a two-year deal um some podcast and derby percent has been given a three-year deal but it's actually a two-year deal no concerns for derby fans regarding his fitness over the next two years has he got a good fitness record with Ipswich? 
He has, yeah. I can remember one injury. I think his hamstring went, but you're talking two and a half years ago now. And that's probably a consequence of the lack of football he was playing towards the end of Paul Lambert and Paul Cook's time. He's pretty much been available for us most of the last two seasons. He's not always featured due to the, you know, the large squad that we've had at League One level and and kind of the, the options we've had at the championship level. But when he's called upon in terms of injury, no real issues. And the one thing you know, he will always give you a hundred percent. If he's on for the last 30 seconds of a game or if he's starting a game, he will approach that game in the same manner and that's what caused so many town fans to to, to really really appreciate him well i remember him scoring a goal um at sunderland i think this year which was a, a key goal i think it all i think it got you the win if i remember rightly um the formation that he played during sort of the last half of the season was he more of a a, a bit part player did, did he come on to to fill a gap up top or was he getting starts and did McKenna have to adjust his formation on the pitch to bring Jackson on, or or is he pretty much the starting eleven kind of player that Derby will see as fans quite instant, instantly? Well, for us, we that, that Sunderland game came in January time and we were undergoing an injury crisis up front. George Hurst got injured on Boxing Day against Leicester and we didn't really have any options for the first two or three weeks of the January window whilst we were trying to get people in. So he started that game up front, but then towards the end of the window, we brought in Ali Alhamadi from Wimbledon for over £1 million and Kiefer Moore signed on loan. So Jackson at that point was always going to kind of be a, a, not a bit a squad player for the rest of the season and probably predominantly used kind of out wide. He wasn't one of the first choice central strikers given the reinforcements that we brought in but he still contributed uh, like I say that Sunderland goal was crucial we'd, we'd been going through a bit of a, uh, a dodgy run we weren't losing games but I think we'd, we'd lost one in, we only won one in five we would we were drawing it's quite a few of the teams around us and that Sunderland goal he got the equaliser we were one nil down he equalised and we won it in the second half with a header from Connor Chaplin and that was a really crucial time because like I say we had no strikers we weren't in the best of form um, but it was it was him that got us back into that game which ultimately led us to winning it so so for the last few weeks of the season, he was kind of uh, a bench option coming off here and there. He certainly wasn't a starter. We had kind of Wes Burns came back in, Amari Hutchinson, who we've recently signed in the last couple of days for 20 million quid to give you an idea of the kind of calibre that was in front of him in the pecking order. They were kind of the first choice players. But as I said, no matter if he comes on for a minute or, or, or the entire game, he always gives 100%. So when we're at the likes of, you know, Coventry away, he's closing down, Blackburn away, he's closing down and he's doing what he had to do. So just closing the conversation because that is a fantastic uh, and honest assessment of of Caden. So if you were going to give Derby fans any hope regarding going back to what we originally started the conversation of regarding the season this year, what would be, we've been out of the championship a couple of years and clearly it has to change from when we were in it during the, the, the COVID times. What would you say are the teams to watch out for and what do you think teams will struggle this year, what, what you remember from last year? Well, obviously, you've got Leeds not going up is kind of a big issue for all the rest of you guys in the league because, you know, they got 90 points, failed to get promoted, which seems crazy looking back on it. But that's the that's the facts. The sides that came down, I think they won't be anywhere near as strong as the three that came down the previous season. You know, a, a, a title race of Leicester, Southampton, Leeds uh, was certainly to us seemed a lot more difficult than one involving the likes of Luton and Burnley. No disrespect to those those clubs that have come back down. Derby, obviously, are a massive club at that level. I'm really pleased for Caden Jackson. He's got this move to you because, you know, you know, before he came to us, I think he played for Wrexham. He played for, uh, I think he went to Fleetwood on loan for a, for, a, for a spell. Obviously, Accrington is where he joined us from. So I'm delighted he's gone to another big, big club at championship level. Um, what are your kind of aspirations for the, for the season? I saw Paul uh, I saw Paul Warren doing an interview saying that Ipswich are now the poster child, but it may have raised expectations a little bit too high, which is understandable. Presumably just a season of consolidation and then look to look to, 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 to crack on in the, in the years to come. Is that the, the plan for Derby this year? The problem that you've caused us, Seb, is the fact that you've had this dream season back-to-back. And Luton, to some extent, of course, is the problem as well. But now everyone is dreaming and um, looking for a minimum of top six. Reality hits you quite hard, doesn't it, when you see the fixture list come out. Um, I'm a realist. I, I always thought that we were we were going to go up quite quickly in League One. Let's be honest, last year's League One was dropped. And I think you all... You were in there four years, but I do believe that the first three that you were in was, was a tough league with some good sides in there. Um, I think the League One last year was awful. And the fact that we had, people said we had a restricted budget, we still had the, probably the highest budget in the league, to be fair. This year's expectations, I've said I'm happy to come 21st, to be completely honest. I think the reality is, is that 
we are stable, but we are nowhere near the club under the previous tenure, which was just wild and, and crazy and ridiculous. And we all know the history and we, we don't want about it. But I think I think there's a bit of a misconception about Ipswich and perhaps you can fill us in. Some people think that you did it on a on a shoestring budget and something, you know, some people see that Ipswich was probably a a, a, a bigger budget last year than people think. Was there a, what kind of budget was spent to get you in the in the Premier League to give sort of Derby some idea what they're competing with? Well, by comparison to those around us, nowhere near, obviously. You know, last last summer we kind of made the signing of George Hurst permanent for about one point five million pounds. He'd been on loan for the previous six months at the the back end of the League One season. He was kind of the big money signing. Amari Hutchinson, who we've just signed permanently, came in on loan from Chelsea. But most of it was kind of clever acquisitions. They've kind of got this model that the ownership group of kind of buying talent to develop them. Leaf Davis is probably the poster child for that. They buy players for like one, one point five million pounds with a view to kind of, you know, develop them and then look to sell on later on down the line in January as I mentioned given the league position we did kind of go out there and Kiefer Moore certainly won't have been cheap in terms of wages although he was only a lone player as I mentioned we spent I think it was 1.7 million on Ali Al Hamadi um, so across the season you're probably looking it's probably certainly less than than 10 million pounds in terms of overall spend across both transfer windows we had a bit of money come in for players that moved on and kind of sell on clauses from from a couple of players that left us in previous years but we certainly didn't break the bank um, it was you know compared to I mean, I remember Leeds coming to Portman Road. I think it was the fourth or fifth game of the season. And they had Jorginho Rutner up front, who was £35 million in the Premier League. And, you know, you hear those numbers and it's, it just seems absolutely crazy. So although they they did kind of, you know, push the boat out in the in the January time with with the loan signing of Kiefer Moore especially, the the spend was was pretty minimal and it was pretty it was pretty sensible spending. You know, at no point did they kind of go for broke trying to get that that key signing in January to get us across the line that could have risked any kind of future of the of the club. What, what, what they do is always incredibly well thought through um and thankfully for us obviously it worked out incredibly incredibly well yeah i think i think derby are going to go down the money ball line you know the infamous yeah. film from america where they brought in mo bobbit from from the england uh cricket uh setup who's an expert in ai and performance enhancement and they've got another guy from from leeds and a uh, rob smith and i think they're going to go down the avenue of exactly what you just said be shrewd be smart be sensible but spread your money across the squad and not just implement it into one or two particular acquisitions because we've seen with other teams that implodes normally and never works. So just a final question regarding it, which Portman Road, love the place, been there many times. Uh, I remember handing out Christmas cards there outside there when we when we had a Christmas fixture with you and we we lost one nil. Have they had to do a lot of uh, changes to the stadium to to allow you to be back in the Premiership or is the uh, stadium going to stay pretty much as it is? No, they're doing an awful lot of work to it. I think pretty much as soon as the bus parade was over on the bank holiday Monday after promotion, the kind of builders moved in. There are a whole host of things that need to be done to it. You know, it, under the previous regime, before the game change over takeover, it was very run down. You know, they they kind of did superficial things to start with. So you've got, you know, paint on the outside, graphics on the outside to kind of tart it up a little bit. We've upgraded things like the um, the, the dugouts in the last couple of years. We relayed a new pitch in the summer um, before the League One promotion season. But at the moment, there is so much work going on to it. People have had to be moved from their seats because you have to give a certain allocation of uh, percentage of your, your gate to away fans which has mean that some of these fans have to move on. They've had Perspex screens built in. They've got to upgrade the cameras from something crazy like six camera angles to over 50 to accommodate all the uh, all the new interests suddenly going to be in us. I think the floodlights have to be upgraded. I think you're talking millions of pounds of kind of infrastructure work that has to be done. The media facilities weren't good enough. That's all been moved and redone. So yeah, there is there is serious money being invested at Portman Road to bring it up to, up to speed. Not on the level that Luton saw last year, um, but certainly an awful lot of things going on uh, to get it up ship shape for, for the Premier League. Well, I hope they don't change the ambience from the outside because the thing I remember about Portman Road is um, as I went down the side of the stadium, there's, there's a there's sort of seven or eight stalls that are all combined and they've got this one of the longest grill pans I've seen of, of cooking burgers I've ever seen in my life. It, it must have gone on for about 20 foot and there was, there was no sort of signage of what they were selling how much they were selling it for but people just knew what, what they were getting but um, look I have a soft spot for it which I've always had always been welcoming as a football club um, do, you, do you anticipate them surviving? 
I hope so. As I said earlier, with McKenna in the dugout, I'll believe anything. I mean, we've lost 10 games in two seasons. So as a fan base, this is, you know, we've been incredibly spoiled and we are very, very used to winning games of football. That will change, obviously. We start against Liverpool at Portman Road. Our second game is Man City away. So it's very much a baptism of fire. There will be weekends where we get absolutely slapped and it's something we're not used to. But... I'm quietly confident, you know, signing Amari Hutchinson the other day for £20 million, which sounds crazy given our transfer record was four million quid from 2001 um that gives me hope and if they can you know continue this smart recruitment then there's no reason we can't give it a bit of a go and yeah if you if you, if you held a gun to my head i think i'd probably say maybe 15th or 16th uh would be a well it would be a phenomenal season oh well, let's hope so and, and the final word then going back to ken jackson summarizing of the six years at ipswich and what a job we're going to expect very much a, 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 a kind of two seat, uh, two halves of his time at Ipswich Town. Um, the, the the difference in him since McKenna took over, the kind of Jackson 2.0 since McKenna took over, is a player that will give Derby, ha- Derby fans, you know, full of confidence. He will run all day for you. He will press all day for you. He will work incredibly hard. His off-field stuff is brilliant. He gets involved in the community and does kind of aspects of that as well, which is always important for a, a footballer in this day and age. Don't expect him to score 20 goals. He, that, that's not his game. But he will do stuff off the ball that will enable the rest of the team to play and enable your kind of really really high quality players to uh to to kind of win games he, he works very very hard and i and i think that kind of that kind of work rate and that mantra will be respected by the derby fans so i wish him all the best because he was a great servant to us seb that's brilliant seb brown from the blue monday podcast really appreciate your time good luck for the premier league i am rooting for you because i do want you to do well like i said every time i've been to it which you've always been very welcoming a great atmosphere and uh, all the best mate Thank you very much and good luck to you guys and good luck to Derby for the season. All the best. Cheers. Thank you, Seb. Goodbye, everybody.